Let me start with some good news. Life is great. Really is. Would you pick a time, any time in history that you would rather live than right now and where you're living? Uh, best time in human history. Poverty rates are lower than ever. Same with global hunger, uh, access to clean water. People make more, work less. Transportation, modern medicine, access to information, women's rights, human rights. So why does it feel like everything is collapsing? That is a really tough question to answer, but it is what lies at the center of a book called A Hunter-Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century Evolution and the Challenges of Modern Life. This couple is the reason I started this podcast, but they have never agreed to be guests until now. Uh, it is a husband and wife evolutionary biologist team who have become an integral part of our new normal. They first gained prominent, uh, prominence in 2017, I think, when they were, at, uh, they were at Evergreen College. They were both professors. They disagreed with the college's day of absence, which demanded that all white students and faculty leave campus for a day. They thought it was crazy. The outrage was immediate and explosive. They were practically forced to resign. Well, then they went on to become founding members of the Intellectual Dark Web, a group of politically homeless rebels, mostly from the left, who violated one of the left's countless holy laws. This is going to be a fascinating conversation. I have no idea where it's going to end up. Please welcome Heather Hang and Brett Weinstein. <laughs> I'm so honored to have you both here. It's really, it's great. I am big fans of yours. I have been watching you for a long time uh, and have wanted this interview for probably over three years. Uh, and I appreciate it. I, I'm a fan of yours because of your courage. In, in almost all things that I have seen, you are taking massive hits uh, and you're doing it because you believe you are standing up for the truth. I happen to believe that too, but you're standing up for the truth and damn the consequences, I guess. So thanks for being here. Thanks for having Thank us. You. Thank yeah. you. How difficult has this been, this journey of yours? Um, it varies. I think in, in many ways it is its own educational experience. And each time we end up in a new chapter, we learn more, I think, you know, Informally speaking, we feel that it is making us anti-fragile, which is not a fun process. But in the end, um, being being stronger and able to to withstand the uh, the slights and challenges is important. If we're if we're going to fight for what matters, it is important that we have the skills to do it, and that's a process that's learned. How? And I want to get to the book because I think we have. <laughs> We've had similar thoughts, uh, except mine's, mine kind of resides a little bit with the Beatles, and yours is in the intellectual space. But, um, and, I, and it's important that we talk about the book because it is, um, I think people can feel the problem, and they can name it here and here and here, but they don't really understand the scope of it. And I think you guys are really hitting the scope of it. But before we hit that, your lives have changed so much, and you believed in so much. How much? Uh, I, two things. I know that I believed what I believed, and then I found out, holy cow, there's a lot of things I was absolutely certain of that are not true. Um, and betrayed by my own people. You know what I mean? How... How much of this has happened to you guys to where you're like, I would have, that's not who I thought we all were. Yeah, very, that, that is certainly true. That's not who I thought we all were, right? Um, but our politics, I don't think have changed. But who we see engaging in similar thinking and truth telling has changed. Yeah. Right? Um, who, like who, you, ten, ten years ago, 
you and I would have we would have never thought of being at the same table because we're on opposite sides, but we're really not. We're really not. And I mean, even 10 years ago, it was becoming clear, you know, in, in the in the milieus where we were getting our news, mm-hmm. that NPR was becoming harder to listen to, for instance, for us, even 10 years ago. Mm. Uh, but that is obviously coming to a head even more in the last one, two, three, four, five years, you know, with yeah. every, and, you know, and that of course is uh, one of the points of the book, that the rate of change itself is changing so fast that the, the search for coherence is becoming ever more difficult. I talked to um, Condoleezza Rice 15 years ago, and I remember during the interview, she said something, because it was biblical what she said, I don't know if she knew it at the time, but uh, what she said, and it stuck out to me, um, because of what it implies. She said, you're starting to see the birth pangs of the things to come. Mm. And when you think of that, um, you realize we're given birth to something, and I'm not sure I want to see what's coming out on the other end. And birth pangs happen faster and faster and closer to closer and the stronger they get. And I think that's true. Things are accelerating at such a rapid rate. Why is that happening? Why is... Is the acceleration due to technology? Is the acceleration, why is it happening like this? Well, there are really two reasons. Uh, I should say this actually uh, applies to your earlier question too. In some sense, the reason that our politics hasn't changed very much is that science and in particular evolutionary biology is our North Star. And so what we believed and what we believe now were based on a model of the universe that hasn't changed very much. Now, who we find ourselves interacting with has changed radically. You know, wait, wait, wait. So explain that part for people who don't necessarily understand evolutionary um, biology. What, what are you talking about here? Well, one, so I'm sure you had something particular in mind, but one thing that I hear in what Brett just said is, our understanding of the universe is based on um, sort of physical reality, and it's not, you know, our politics aren't dependent on the social scene. Yeah. And so who it is that we're talking with and who it is that we're finding common ground with has changed. Um, but that doesn't mean that what we think about underlying processes has, because that was never a social set of beliefs for us. Right. Okay. So human beings, uh, we may differ here on what the best way to view ourselves is, um, but maybe less than you would imagine. We are creatures that have to function in the world, and our nature was built in an environment that we no longer live in. Correct. Now, we humans are better than any other creature at changing our software to adapt to new habitats. But our habitats are now changing so rapidly that we can't keep up. And that is partially about technology, but it's also about the fact, and in evolutionary biology, we have a metaphor that we like. We talk about adaptive landscapes in which opportunities are peaks. They are basically mountain ranges of opportunity. And in order to get from one opportunity to another, you have to pass through what we call an adaptive valley. And so your trepidations about where we're headed is part and parcel of the fact that whatever else may be true, we are in transition. Yes. Our, our tools yes. are not uh, up to managing the problems that we now face. So we have to find a new way of being. Our, our, not only our physical tools, but our mental and psychological tools. Even Precisely. our tools of governance, as excellent yes, right. as they are. It are just... feels like the government feels like it's stuck in 1950. Mm-hmm. The world feels like it's headed towards scientific, not scientific, the technology field feels like it's in 2050. And we're kind of standing in between going, that world doesn't work. And I don't even know what that world means. Well, let's be, you know, frank about this. Our, our governmental structures are really 18th century structures and they're brilliant, but they couldn't possibly manage a world this far from what the founders were capable of understanding. I mean, the founders never saw a train or a chainsaw. So, so let me ask you on that because I would guess that we actually agree on this. The founders believed, I mean, they thought it would last 30 years. Um, They did not think it was going to last like now. And I think they would get here if they could, a time machine, they're here. They would look at everything and they'd say, great, how long did America last? You know, they would not recognize what they have done. And then I don't think they would have recognized it in 1960, you know. Um, 
but they did allow through constitutional adaptation, et cetera, et cetera, that they did allow us to adapt. They did say, we're not, we don't see everything. So just adapt and adopt, you know, constitutional amendments to get there. It's not the framework or the mission statement. We hold these truths to be self-evident or the framework that is adaptable. It's that we are trying to force a bunch of stuff into it that it's not meant to do. It's meant to reject that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, no, I, I, I see it very much the same way. And I think your framing of we can't go back to 1950. Right. And we don't know. We what, don't want to. And we don't want to. And um, those who would claim that that was a perfect world are, are misunderstanding what yes. that world was. And those who are saying, you know, Full, full bore ahead to 2050, no matter what, because progress is always the answer. And if it if it requires rejecting everything about the old, who cares? Well, that's also a mistake. And that's, so, you know, progress, yes, and tradition, yes, but we're going to have to pick and choose, and we're going to have to do so with intention. And that's why I think we're having such, I always look at right wing, left wing. It's a bird. And if you <laughs> chop off one of the wings, it ain't going to fly. And conservatives i don't know how conservatives define themselves but i i look at conservative for the root of the word i'm conserving the things that do work and looking to the future on new things that might work better but let's not throw all of this out it's uh, amazing how difficult this lesson is for both the right and left wing yes. each one seems to think that it has the answer and it doesn't understand that the the dynamism of our system is in the tension between these yes things, right liberals always want to improve things and they always underestimate the unintended consequences yes and conservatives if left to their own devices would avoid progress because of those unintended consequences right. so what we really need to do though is adapt our system i think uh, the founders would have expected us to change it much more radically than we have in order to keep up you know, we've treated certain things as sacred that shouldn't have been and that they wouldn't have expected. Um, but what we need to do is get a system that is not so violent in the fluctuation that balances these two forces. In other words, you, you mentioned up top that there's quite a bit we agree on, and this is now well established. The Hidden Tribes report revealed that there is what they call the exhausted middle, this vast group of us yes. that aren't extreme, that agree on most of yeah. uh, what we want, at right. least. And then we differ over how close we are to it and what might be done to, to go the rest of the distance. But we are being shut out by extremists that mm -hmm. are pushing us into viewing you know, the other side is not quite human. And that's a very dangerous process, unfortunately, with a lot of historical precedent that suggests um, we should not continue down that road. So now this has been a book that you've wanted to write for like 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why now? And let's start on the main message. I mean, 21st century hunter and gatherer doesn't seem to go together. Yeah. So it's, it's a hunter gatherer's guide to the 21st century. And as we say in it, we could have named it a number of things. You know, an agriculturalist's guide, a post-industrialist's guide, a mammal's guide. Like all of these things are, are true descriptors of what the modern human condition is and are true moments in time from our evolutionary history. And hunter-gatherer is the, like the moment that most people have in their head. It's like, oh, that's what we're adapted to, right? Like hunter-gatherers on the African savanna. But we've been all of these things. And so our point in the book, um, using the term of art from evolution, the environment of evolutionary adaptedness for humans, is not just hunter-gatherers. It's all of these points in our history. And because humans are so flexible, are so much software compared to hardware, we are born with so much capability that isn't hardwired in more than any other animal on the planet, then you know, we are adapted to being post-industrialists not as well as we should be, and not maybe even possibly to be perfectly adapted given the rate of change. But you know, why, why now? Why now in part because um, we were talking about writing it for, you know, for 10 years while we were teaching, while we were still at Evergreen, and we were able to now. You know, when, mm -hmm. when, when Evergreen blew up, we began to have an audience, and 
the words of our many generations of students were still ringing in our ears, you know, we're still affiliated, connected with many of them who had been saying to us for years, please find a way to take the teaching of evolutionary biology and specifically what the two of you have, what the two of us have been doing um, into some kind of packaged form so that it can be delivered unto other people. My dad said before he died, he said, I'm kind of glad I'm not going to be around to have to see and make the decisions that your generation and the one following you are going to have to make. He said, um, but it's going to be fascinating one way or another. He said, he was born in 1926, and he said, I remember as a kid, we looked up at the moon, and we never thought man could walk on the moon. And when we started seeing Buck Rogers and stuff, that was movie stuff. That wasn't actually landing on the moon. He said, halfway through my life, we're on the moon. And look at us now. He said, all of the technology, everything that is moving so rapidly. And I said, I know it's really exciting. He said, it is, but we're missing something. And I said, what? And I think this is what the whole point of your book is. He said, read Plato. We're struggling exactly the same place. Read Jesus. Same people, same problems. We've had such an explosive growth here and really nothing here in many ways. Is that the problem that we're growing so fast, part of the problem that we're growing so fast, and yet we haven't worked on this along with the fact that social media, we're in tribes. It forces us back to that tribal nature because that's been in us for thousands and thousands of years. Well, it forces us back in one way. But I mean, really what you're saying, the reason that Plato is still resonant and Plato is resonant. I mean, you, you see Plato's oh, yeah. cave in mm -hmm. the Matrix. Oh, yeah. People don't necessarily know that they're revisiting that same puzzle. Um, but part of the problem is that these things aren't really fundamentally about those who first spotted them, they are part of the underlying architecture. They are failures of game theory that result in certain problems uh, reoccurring in a new form until you figure out how to solve them. And so isn't that part of that's a one thing that I don't understand that people think that we evolve? Well, yes, we do, but we're all born at the same starting point. And so we have to discover that when I first read Plato, when I was an adult, I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, th this is brilliant and it's exactly what I'm struggling with. Because isn't that a self-discovery thing? You can't pass that information and those answers on you biologically, can, can you? you? Well, first of all, one of the things that our field has done a terrible job of recognizing and therefore conveying is that our, our cultural layer, our software is biological, right? You'll very often hear people say, is it cultural? or is or it biological, biological. It's, a, it's a false dichotomy. You can say, is it genetic or is it cultural? That's a fair division. But culture is every bit as biological as genes. The problem is when you do discover the answer to a puzzle, so let's, for example, say that um, our rights of free expression, which the founders clearly understood very well, very well, were in some sense a response to part of Plato's observation about what happens when the person who has escaped the cave returns and yeah. attempts to convey it, right? Yeah. So our, our speech rights are in effect an agreement that we have that actually we don't get to do that to the guy who comes back into the cave and says that the shadows aren't the real world, Correct. right? But the problem is if you live in a world downstream of that discovery and you've always had these rights, you don't realize how important they are and what they are really protecting. And so you uninvent the progress because you don't see the problem, which is of course one of the themes of our, our book we talk about Chesterton's fence and the idea that if you see a structure and you don't know what its purpose is, you'd be foolish to think it probably doesn't have one and therefore it can be safely eliminated mm -hmm. until you've understood what the purpose was. Mm -hmm. At that point, then you know whether it continues to, to play that role mm -hmm. or whether that role is, is obsolete. Um, and so, you know, the reinvention of problems that were solved is a next level problem that we have to address because it will happen in every era of history where we have been successful and people suddenly see, uh, I don't know, efficiency as dominant over the elegant solution architecture. I, uh, I remember 
just a few years ago, for the very first time, I thought, no, these things are not self-evident. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> they, they, they were at one point, but they've been lost. Freedom of speech. I mean, right. wow, what happened there? I thought we all agreed on it. What happened? Yeah, what hap- I mean, par- part of what happened, I think, is that there's a reductionism that takes over when we are asked to understand things and we are able to measure. And so, you know, once we can measure something and we have numbers, the numbers stick in our heads and we forget the emergent whole and we forget how glorious humans are, actually, mm-hmm. and what emergent beings we are. And so social media is a stand-in for social interaction. And it's become even more so, of course, during, during COVID, but, you know, really since its inception, people mistook it for the entire thing. They mistook social media for social interaction. And, you know, the fact is we're here with you. And that is a very different experience very different. than if we were uh, on a Zoom call with Correct. you, right? Without being, without having any access at any conscious level to why or what exactly is being conveyed that's more because we're actually here with you, there's just more, right? Because, because humans are more than even many of the things we have yet measured. And, you know, as scientists, we hope, we, you know, we are seeking an objective, complete, accurate understanding of the universe, hoping to get ever, ever closer, more and more refined, knowing we might never get there, and also knowing that the tendency to reduce to a single variable will tend to exclude other things that may have just as much meaning, if not more. I don't remember which chapter it was. Towards the beginning, you did the the lineage yeah. of the human journey. Can you just take, take us through that quickly? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as briefly as you can. Well, I think we can probably cut the it from 3.5 billion years. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, don't yeah, have yeah, that yeah. much time. At least do it faster than that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, roughly 3.5 billion years ago, uh, life, life came into existence on Earth. And uh, 2 billion-ish, I think, if memory serves, uh, we have things like the evolution of sex um, 1 to 2 billion years ago. And it's possible that in our lineage, that, is, that, is, that has been unchanging since then. By 500 million years or so, we had become animals. Uh, and you know, we, already had, we already had multicellularity. We already had um, uh, multicellularity. And before that, we had... What does that mean? Uh, that means that we, instead of a single cell moving around on its own, we're now aggregates of cells okay. that aren't just aggregates. We are actually um, combining with those other cells and their specialization between them. So it's, you know, it's some it, early on anyway, life evolving is sort of increasing level of specialization. Mm-hmm. And um, so as, as animals, we now begin to have, um, boy, where do I, what, what do I include? What well, don't I? I think it's, it's worth pointing out that, you know, you can trace our lineage going forward as Heather is doing. But one of the things that stands out when you begin to think in terms of what all of these lineages, not just ours, looked like is how many themes are actually recovered, even with creatures that don't look anything like us. So it's very surprising the first time you realize that although we animals and plants in some sense are distinct evolutions of sexual reproduction, that what we call male parts of plants and female parts of plants actually have the same biases built in them in terms of, for example, their enthusiasm for, uh, for sex with partners about whom they are not choosy, right? The female, <laughs> female parts of a plant are very choosy and male parts of a plant much less so. And the reason is exactly the same, right? So that this is why we presented in the book the model of evolution that we did, which is that once you begin to realize that yes, there are you know an indefinitely large number of particulars and you could learn them all, but there's also the underlying problems that are being solved and there aren't that many solutions. So just as Plato's cave you know, continues to reoccur because the underlying dynamics are really what's being noticed rather than some specific instance of something, the fact that any time, you know, if, if you start out with creatures that have sex but they have identical size gametes, you will quickly get to a state in which they no longer have identical size gametes. 
and the one that has large gametes will become choosy, and the one that has small mobile gametes will be much less choosy. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about a tree or a, a gorilla, the logic is the same. So once, once you get that message and you say, well, okay, maybe what I should do, instead of investing in knowing all of the creatures of the earth, what I should do is invest in understanding what problem they're solving and what the themes are in those solutions, which then brings us to our problem, which is humans, better than any other creature that has ever existed, by far, are wonderful at switching from one niche to another. When we describe virtually any other species on the planet, we are talking about a type of creature and an opportunity that it exploits. But for us, we can't name what that opportunity is that humans exploit because we do so many different things and have throughout our history done so many different things. How is that possible? Because we have a, a near miraculous capacity to bootstrap new programming. We are a kind of a generalist robot and we have the ability to write our own new software for opportunities no ancestor had ever addressed. Uh -huh. That capacity gives us the ability to think our way out of the problems that I think all three of us here at the table recognize are headed towards us. But what we don't have is the ability to keep up with the rate of change. The fact that we don't even live in the world that we were born into, right? We cannot educate our children and say, here's the world that you're going to have to make a living in because none of no us idea. have any idea what it's going to look yeah. like. That's too fast. Even our amazing rate of change, our ability to change in a reasonable and coherent way at a rapid rate is just far outstripped by that technological pace. And if we don't rein it in, you know. It's well, that's not going to happen. Is it reining technology? I mean. Uh, Ray Kurzweil is a friend of mine, and uh, I, I think he's the most fascinating guy and the scariest dude I've ever met in my life, um, because he doesn't, he, you know, I said to him at one point about upgrading, you know, becoming the singularity, and um, I said, well, but what about those people who don't? And he said, well, they, they'll, everybody will want to. But what if you don't want to do that? Right. Well, why would you? And, and so there's this, this circular thinking that everything's going to be okay and to disregard what that actually means to the homo sapien, you know? Um, and we're just moving so quickly and there's such arrogance in there. I mean, every piece of technology we have is the greatest experiment on the human species Ever done. Yep. The scale Every piece. It just keeps going up. But let's take your question. Okay. Right? Will we rein it in? That's a hard question to answer. Will it be reined in? That's an easy question. We will either rein it in or... It will rein us it in. It will rein us in. The processes are already unsustainable in very simple, literal terms. And what that means is either we figure out a comparatively gentle path to some way of existing that does not continue down this trajectory or the trajectory will collapse because it is unstable. So what are the things that are fighting us, fighting the, the natural man, if you will, that we need to, that, we, that technology is exacerbating, that we need to, we, we need to recognize and rein in? I'm not sure natural versus unnatural is the right dichotomy because uh, part, part of what we explore in the book is the idea that this is actually, this could have been predicted, right? That, yeah. this, that this, the human condition is one of such software, of such lability, of such flexibility uh, that of course we would end up becoming not own, you know, our worst enemy. But what we also need to do then is figure out how to be our, our best friend, right? right. Like to, to, to recognize that we have to share the planet with everyone else. And also that that doesn't just include non-humans, but all of the humans who are here. And sure, there are probably too many of us, but we have to do what we can to live well with the people who are here now and, and figure out you know, our better angels, how to explore our better angels, which are... How do you do that in a society that is just pounding each other? You stand up and do something. I've been working to try to rescue people that... And I don't care what your sexuality... I don't care. I don't care. I understand, I think, how people must have felt 
trying to rescue Jews from Germans. These people mean nothing to you. Just just give them to me. We'll take yeah. them. And it's You're just talking about Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's just this weird thing where it's just it's not even human. The emotion is just, it's weird. Um, and and I was over there and, you know, people started saying all kinds of stuff. And my first reaction was no good deed goes unpunished. I mean, you can do anything and nobody is everybody's so cynical and everything else. How do you become better angels when there's zero reward for it in society? Well, it's punishment. In part, we haven't really understood the puzzle yet. All evolved creatures have the same purpose, and that is a very unfortunate statement because if, it's, if, if you share a purpose with a malaria pathogen, it's not much of a purpose. It's mm-hmm. not honorable. It's not decent. So we humans have the most remarkable capacity to do tremendous things. We can be compassionate. We can develop insight. We can innovate. We can uh, create beauty. All of these things. But those are all, they all came to be in the service of that mind-numbing objective. But once you recognize that, this is another place that our field has not uh, been very good. We've given people the impression, and in fact most evolutionists believe that creatures are trying to produce as many offspring as possible. And really producing more offspring is a means to an end. The end is to lodge one's genes as deeply into the future as possible. And so the reason that you see the pattern that you're seeing is because in fact people are wired without their awareness of it for lineage versus lineage competition. And to the extent that two lineages are fighting over a limited resource, like a patch of territory, the desire to rid that territory of the other lineage is extremely powerful. This accounts for the greatest tragedies of history, I think without exception. Mm -hmm. And the problem, therefore, is to convey the message to whatever part of the human is, uh, is listening that actually the objective, getting into the future, requires that we stop doing that now. That's how we got here, but we have to stop doing the thing that got all of our lineages to this point in history if we want this to continue. And really, you know, philosophically speaking, we have the most glorious opportunity that any creature has ever had. The, the earth, damaged as it is, is a beautiful place, more beautiful than any other we've seen or even have reason to know exists. I contend that it is a powerful uh, spirit that is alive that will kill us before we can kill it. It will rid itself of the disease of man if we don't, if we don't, if we don't harmonize, it's bigger than us. It it will just, at least I think, we're already seeing signs of of things that it's doing, but it's going to survive. Well, even if it means it kills us. You don't yeah, think so? There's a manner of speaking in which you, Not have, necessarily. you have to be right. But I mean, just yeah. even notice that, you know, there are 400 civilian nuclear reactors operating on planet Earth that require constant vigilance to yeah. keep them cool enough that they don't melt down and spill right. out all of their contents. So we've even set up nature. So even if we were to do ourselves in, we would take a lot with us. Yeah. Right. We've created an inadvertent doomsday machine for no good reason. Yes. So the recognition that we have the most beautiful planet that we know of and that all we have to do in order to continue this indefinitely and really to provide the opportunity of being human, which is the most glorious opportunity there is to provide it to the maximum number of people. All we have to do is solve the sustainability puzzle. Right. All we have to do is figure out how to get along well enough and to not do things that undermine our opportunity. We have to not liquidate the planet. And that, that's really the puzzle we're trying to so solve. So how, how do you do that um, when, I mean, this is a puzzle I've been trying to solve because I, I believe in the free market. Um, I believe it is the fastest way to solve uh, problems. But I also believe that, uh, that you know, um, you can't just read wealth of nations, you have to read moral sentiments. If the people are good, the free market will create all kinds of things. The people are not good. It will, it will create whatever it is they desire. And there's something in, as I look at capitalism, you look at it and it goes, 
goes great, and then people make a lot of money, as de Tocqueville said, and they get a lot of power, and then they kick the door behind them, or they just get so greedy, they just... But the average person is, I've found, I've talked to Palestinians without cameras, talk to Palestinians, they sound exactly like the Jews. I just want my family. I just, all of this crap, that's the tired American. How do you get that into the power structure? Well, okay, uh, I don't want to get us too far afield, but I do think that this is a place where left and right need to see each other. They need to understand the part of the puzzle that the other gets and realize the part of the puzzle that they've got wrong. So I would argue markets are the best mechanism we've got Mm -hmm. for figuring out how to do things. They are absolutely brilliant at solving that kind of problem. They are terrible at figuring out what problem to solve. As you point out, they discover every defect in the human character and figure out how to exploit it. And they turn us into monsters that we are not inherently. Correct. So, and so there are places that markets don't belong. Places like sex and music, right? Yes. What you want to do is figure out how to take that amazing tool and point it at the problems that we want solved and to keep it away from the problems we don't want solved. We don't want it finding our defects. We want to tell it what our values are and then allow it to solve the problems of how best to reach and uh, enhance those values. So the problem is if you're a market fundamentalist and you think, well, this is the best tool we've got for problem solving, let's point it at everything, then you end up creating the hazard where it solves Correct. all sorts of problems you don't want solved. Correct. And so really, it's a tool. And, you know, just like, a, you know, a power saw, right? A power saw is a great tool, but you don't want it running around your <laughs> shop, right? You, know, you want right. it under control, doing things that you need done. And that's, that's possible. You know, on the left, though, what you hear is, you know, capitalism is the enemy, right? They don't like markets at all. Right. And then on the right, you hear that markets are what we've got for solving problems. So let's get to it. And really, the point is, let's figure out how to refine that tool so that it does what we need done. There remains the problem, though, that that Glenn invoked of the people who make it and kick the door closed behind them or 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 the people who or the people, some of them with very good intention that are working to solve problems that you're like, no, don't no. No, what, what are you doing? No, 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 that's, that's a bad, but they feel it's, an Amer- it's a, not an American thing. It's a human thing. There's a mountain. I'm going to cross it. Uh, and so they're breaking barriers that maybe we should hold off on. I'm just, let's, let's just all talk about that before we do it. I do, and I think those are two different problems. Okay. Right? The, the first one is one of sort of a willingness to dehumanize the other yes. so that you can excuse your own bad behavior. Correct. And that, I think, is easier, more easily dealt with, although we haven't seen it dealt with, than the sort of the tech utopianism of if there's a problem that can be approached, then we will approach it no matter what and no breaks. Right. But at okay, least- so, wait, so, so can, yeah. can you tell me how, how do we begin to solve if that is a problem the first set of people how can the the average person begin to affect meaningful change there you know we've begun to see um we know of some people and organizations who are explicitly working to you know bridge the divide cross cross the divide and it's it's very much like what you're talking about doing in Afghanistan, but people working, for instance, within the U.S. to bring, you know, red voters and blue voters together into the same room and just have them meet and exchange names and eye contact and say, hey, I also have a kid and a dog and a mortgage and I'm human too. Right. And there is value for a very few in keeping us from recognizing each other's humanity. So how with, with social media, it's much harder to remind ourselves that we're all human. And I think, you know, basically what these sorts of conversations and as much in human contact as possible, where you actually are engaging with people with kindness and generosity. But that doesn't that doesn't necessarily get to the people who've already kicked the door closed behind them. Um, I think this I want to introduce you to my Beatles thought that I had. Uh, 
I was listening to, I don't remember which song it was. It might have been Revolution. And I had been listening to some John Lennon, and I thought, part of me said, thank God they don't have that tool in their hand. Because mm. the hippie movement in the 60s, it, I mean, it did a lot of good. It also did some bad. Um, but it, the real hippie movement was based not in drugs or anything. It was based in love, a new kind of consciousness. And you did have, if you listen to the music of the 60s, much of it is very inspiring, you know, and based in love. We don't have that now. We don't have a John Lennon. We don't have anybody preaching that. The songs, the, the culture, you said, keep you know, business out of music, which I'd like to explore with you, but um, we don't have a soundtrack that's helping us move forward in a loving way. Right. And the 60s had that. Well, all of these have been unnatural eras, and... The problem is you have to track, you know, there, in some ways we have uh, better music now yeah, because there are more bands. It's not all concentrated by the fact that you've got three stations in your area that, and everybody's listening to the same, you know, the same soundtrack. You have a lot of room, but the point right. is it means that we're not synchronized in the way that used to be. ancestral humans would have been and that people were artificially synchronized in the I, 60s. I miss and... You know, this is so stupid, but I miss the fact that it was much watched, you know, must watch Thursday night, NBC, and we all would come to work and we would talk about friends. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I don't really miss that era, but right. I, there was something that bound us together that we don't have, except for the Super Bowl now. There was, even there was even value if the in TV the synchrony. was terrible, yes. the fact that everybody was at least thinking about the same Correct. conundrum had a value. And so right. there's a question about how do you get the best of both worlds? How do you get the increase in quality that comes from having many more bands contributing to our sonic landscape? At the same time, you get enough synchrony that we understand each other. And, you know, again, the, the problem of hypernovelty that we talk about in the book. Explain that. The rate of change that is outstripping our capacity to alter ourselves so that we are not being harmed, that we are not being made sick psychologically, physiologically, and socially yeah. by our environment. That problem is actually, it's multi-layered. So not only, you know, people our age have the experience of living in a very different world than they grew up, and we all remember you know, at the beginning of the email era, mm -hmm. right? We all made a mistake somewhere where we sent some email that we should have thought more carefully mm -hmm. about and didn't realize that the bandwidth was going to be reduced and that somehow this was very different than a letter and it wasn't quite like a conversation, Yes, right? And the problem is, okay, we get that, but people who are young enough who have grown up online have this as their developmental environment. And I guess part of one of the many messages in the book is that, there are things that physical reality will teach you developmentally so that you understand them, whether you could say what they were or not, yes. right? If you walk into a bar and you behave the way people behave on Twitter, you'll get beaten up and you'll yeah. learn not to do it, right? On Twitter, you may not learn that lesson. In right. fact, you may get so many likes that you continue to do that because it feels like the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. You may not understand, therefore, what uh, human conflict is and why it should be reserved for very special circumstances. So... What we are doing is we are not only creating an environment that we can't keep up with. We are creating an environment that is shaping our children in utterly arbitrary ways. And when they become adults, they will then be living in a world that isn't even that one that we created that shaped them. It will be some new world and their toolkit will be out of phase with where they're going to be. And we can see this coming a mile away. What's it going to do to them? It's going to make them miserable and unhealthy. And the thing that we have to realize is that it's the generating function. We have to stop that process. We have to slow down the rate of change enough that we can keep up. I guess one thing I would add is that the social media environment in particular makes us likely to choose our arguments for what we hate rather than with what we agree. And it's not that there isn't plenty to disagree with by saying, actually, I stand for this. And that other thing is something else that is at odds with this thing that I stand for, as opposed to, I hate that. I don't know what I stand for, but I hate that. And the, the standing primarily in opposition is 
deadly. you know, de facto divisive and, and deadly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've, I'm working on something now that, uh, um, I'm call, I'm calling it the power of one. And it is just, you recognize that you have control, not of everything else, but you mm-hmm. and just, just stand for, you know, the, I had a, a woman uh, who saved Jews in World War II, and I had her meet with my family and tell her. She was 16 years old. She's saving 100 Jews, hiding them under a bar. I mean, it's an amazing story. And uh, she gave me some great advice, and in a nutshell, it is you don't have to be a hero. You just have to remember what your parents taught you was right and wrong, and just don't, don't move from that. It's right. It's wrong. You know, I'm no, that person is a, still a person and I'm going to treat that. I don't care what everybody else does. That's what I'm going to do. And um, it's it's hard now, however, because everything is I said to my wife all the time. I don't carry a phone and um, my wife does and everybody else does. And I'm like, you know, you used we were fine without that. We were fine without that. And we can be fine again without that. Our life may slow down, but you're convinced that you can't uh, live without it. And then uh, because it brings a lot of great things to your life. But then on top of it, while you're being convinced that you're also being convinced that you should be the opposite of what your parents taught you was right and wrong. That's absolutely right. Um, And I think there's part of what you're saying that's perfectly straightforward and, and clearly right, right? What's right and wrong has not basically changed. No. Um, it, it, but it has in society, but it hasn't in reality. Right. But it has in society, not because the fundamentals are different, but because the particulars are. So Explain that. For example, um, our capacity to be rewarded for behavior that creates massive harm in lives that we never see. Right. Yeah. Even just even your investment portfolio. Mm-hmm. Right. You're damned if you do and damned if you don't. Right. You, you are in competition with other investors. And what you need in order to to stay afloat is to find the investments that pay back. But those investments may be profitable, not because they are actually enhancing the world in some way, but because they successfully externalize harm onto someone who can't defend themselves. And so that's obviously immoral. But if it's, you know, if it's buried in your retirement fund, you don't know that you're harming somebody else, nor are you in a position to do anything about it. So we have to begin to recognize that, although you can't operationalize this, but just as a thought experiment. Hang on just a second. Yeah. Because what you sound like you're saying is ESG would be a good thing. That is, then somebody else is making the judgments on what, do you know what ESGs are? Uh, Environmental, social justice, and uh, governance uh, scores. And all companies are, Mm -hmm. banks are now starting to make loans based on, well, are you involved in social justice? What do you get? And that's an, it right now, at least for sure, it's an arbitrary number. They decide what you are, what you're, what you're not. That institutionalizing that kind of stuff scares the hell out of me. Right. It, well, this is exactly yeah. the kind of thing that conservatives correctly fear. Because yeah. if you build that system, no matter how well-intentioned you are, it is guaranteed to be gamed. And it's just the next landscape yep. of warfare. Yep. Right. So that's not, that's not where you go. But it, well, and it includes a category error, right? Like lumping in environmental with social justice causes uh, would, would seem to, to not be aligning those of us who deeply care about the environment and see a tremendous amount of harm in modern social justice, for instance. So... Uh, I want to go back to something that we were talking about earlier, which is what happens when you gather conservatives and and liberals together. And one trick that I have learned um, is that the first thing you should do is figure out what it is that you actually agree on. Because very frequently, Mm. puzzles that we differ over, actually, there's half of them that we don't differ over. And then but we recognize the other person. We sort of figure that everything that they're saying is wrong. This mm-hmm. isn't the case. So, for example, mm-hmm. if, if I go into a room of conservatives, I can be pretty sure that we're going to disagree over um, environmental sustainability and in particular uh, climate change. Right. But if I ask the question, if you believed 
and human beings were causing substantial alteration to the climate that was going to degrade the, the capacity of the earth to sustain people in the future, right? Would you be in favor of doing something about it? Virtually every reasonable person will agree to that. And then it's, we, we, it's a fascinating, it's fascinating because I, I, you can't argue with global warming. You can't argue with a thermometer, right? Is the thermometer going up or down? What's, what's happening? Um, you can't argue with the changes that are happening. You might be able to argue, is man doing this or is this cyclical? But we could have that argument and, and it's a healthy argument to have. What's strange is you can't have the argument on how to fix it. That's the hardest one. Right. That's the one that we're presented with. Destroy the planet or destroy humanity and everything that we have. Just burn it all up at once. That's what it seems like to conservatives. You're like, no, I, I don't think we should do it that way. Right. But I, I'm sure there are things that we could agree on. But those things don't ever really seem to ever be talked about. That everything's always pushed. Well, that's why you, actually, you have to get to the place where you've agreed that if we are damaging the planet in this way, that we all agree that we should stop, right? Whether we know how to do it, whether that's even plausible, because that is a conversation that people can have and be decent to each other, right? right. What do we do if that's where we are, right? <laughs> Can I just interrupt for a moment? This reminds me very much of a framing in different domains that I've been making lately, which is, you know, two people come together and the first person says, my God, there's a problem. And person B says, yeah, there sure is. And person one says, therefore, the solution is X. And person two says, well, that's a big problem, but I don't think your solution is going to do it. And the first person, and, you know, this might be team blue and team red, or it might be reversed. Yeah. But the first person says, if you don't agree with my solution, then you don't think this is a problem. And there is just a basic logical failure here. But it is the way that many of us are, are demonized and dismissed because we say that solution that you've come up with strikes us as wrong or incomplete, or at least or, how about there's other things on the table. Or another scam to build an empire of money for something else. Right. You're like, right. wait, that, right. that's not. But that rejection of solution says nothing about whether or not you thought there was a problem in the Correct. first place. And that, you know, I know conservatives, they, um, and this is not a blanket statement. Conservatives, especially that live in rural areas, they consider themselves great stewards of the land. And generally they are. My grandfather, I remember him saying all the time, he's a farmer. These nuts are telling us how to manage Yellowstone and the forests in California. And I remember him distinctly in the 70s saying, California will burn to the ground, mm. burn to the ground if they do this. He was a real environmentalist in my book, you know, but God, no, you can't be an environmentalist if you disagree with what they're doing to save the environment. All right. So yes. the solution here, to the extent that there is one, is actually um, weirdly buried in the second to last chapter of our book. Because what we describe is a pattern, an evolved human pattern that goes back millions of years in all likelihood. Certainly it goes back hundreds of thousands in which human beings swap out their software program to engage new opportunities. And the way they do that is by plugging their minds into each other and essentially engaging in what we would now call a parallel processing, right? And this wouldn't look like anything strange. It would look like people standing around a campfire discussing what the problems are, what solutions might look like. And with their different types of expertise, they would come up with a new solution, a prototype. And then over time it would be refined and then it would be driven into the cultural layer and handed one generation to the next. Now the point though is this implies that our minds have two ways of running. If we are in a situation that our ancestors' wisdom is applicable to, then we are wise to apply it, maybe refine it a little bit, but not to question it too much, right? That is a naturally conservative impulse. If we are in a situation that our ancestors' wisdom is inapplicable because they didn't know anything about this, this predicament, then we have to rise to this collective consciousness and figure out what to do about the puzzle. And the point, we are, we are in a battle about whether or not this is that moment. Is this the moment to 
you know, double down on the ancestor's wisdom, or is this the moment to do something different, which is inherently dangerous? It's that danger that liberals don't tend to see. They want progress, they want to fix problems, and they don't recognize the hazard of unintended consequences. Now, we are facing issues that are far more, in my opinion, far more dangerous than the 1950s. Oh, that was mm. nuclear holocaust. This is, I mean, this is just, I mean, as, as Stephen Hawking said, the end of Homo sapiens by 2050. You make the wrong, and he didn't mean that we'd be extinct. We would be chipped. We'd be incorporated, one way yeah, or the incorporated other. into mm-hmm. it. So I don't want that. I don't right. think a lot of people want that. You know, if, if we're not careful right now, we're, we're, and no one is talking about it. No one's talking about the, re- the real, true peril that is on our doorstep. Right. The peril that is actually um, should be uncontroversial, right? Just yeah. the simple, the degree to which the power of our tools has gone up, the degree to which we are interconnected has gone up. We are now uh, one experiment and your population can't make a mistake and go extinct and everybody else, yeah. will, you know, do the next thing. We're all in it together at this point. But the key to getting people out of their autopilot cultural mode and into their conscious how do we solve this new problem mode is the recognition that the old program when you run it creates errors it throws errors like a computer program that runs into some sort of an input it doesn't expect and so and what are those errors that the old programming well the conservatives need to see the the fact that you know for example that we have a situation in which um the most productive and dynamic nation that has ever existed, which has become a model for the West, right? People have rightly adopted what the founders got right, and they've employed it across the world to good effect, that we would endanger that by failing to recognize the humanity of other participants in that system in some sort of team sport mentality that jeopardizes the whole project is obviously insane. Right. Just the simple fact that we seem to be coming apart at the seams, despite the fact that whatever our problems are, the system is still functioning. So let me. Uh, it, amazingly so. Amazingly so. I thought we would be gone 10 years ago. I thought we'll never. This thing is resilient. It's crazy. Um, but the ancient wisdom would come from George Washington, who said, don't do the two party thing. Don't. Don't. Because you'll do tribal and then one person will realize they can milk it and become more popular and then the other one will up their game. I mean, that's that there's your founder's wisdom. Well, well, we did it. So now how do you undo it? First thing to do, I would say, is you need to recognize we need to separate effectively the founder's values from their mechanism. Right. Their mechanism was great, but it's run its course. It's, it cannot solve these problems. Right. First past the post is a lethal hazard now. And it's part of what's causing um, this, you know, team against team mentality inside of our system that threatens us. But the way you get to the conscious mind engaging the puzzle rather than the autopilot mind is you recognize the errors. And so if you get these puzzles really well refined, the thing that you see very often sounds like a riddle, right? Or it sounds like a paradox. That's the indication that there's something here that needs to be thought about carefully rather than just doing what we all Mm -hmm. learned must be done. So I like to say the following thing. Um, I'm a a liberal. In fact, I'm a reluctant radical. I don't want to be a radical because radical change is dangerous, but I don't Mm -hmm. think we have a choice. We have to engage radical change as frightening as that is. That's one riddle. But the other side of it is I want to live in a world that is so good that I get to be a conservative. I'm not a liberal because change is my objective, but we do need to get somewhere that the point is actually from here, change would be a mistake, right? Change isn't worth it. What we're upending is so successful at doing what we say we want to accomplish. So don't you think, though, that I, I could be wrong. I think the average person would agree with you on that, both sides. Right. That... This isn't working, but, you know, when you say, because you you scare me when you say, but the founder's systems aren't working. We're not using the founder's systems. We haven't been for over a hundred years. We've upended all of the, because as you're saying, you know, we have to have these conversations, us standing around a campfire. 
What's happening to us is everything is global. And so only the elites get to make those decisions around their campfire at Davos. Yep. And we're left out. The, the, the real change comes, real meaningful change comes. For instance, I'm not against universal health care. When you can show me it works and can sustain itself. Otherwise, I hate this system, too, but it's the best one we got, you know. So let's keep doing. We should be 50 states instead of one country, 50 little experiments. Try it. Do this. See what works. Take the best of that and work. But you have to break them down to the family, to the community, uh, to the state before it goes global. Everybody well, now is trying to solve the problem for the world. Can't. Well, and it immediately goes there. The problem immediately. Immediately. Yeah. The problem is you've got a tension between two truths here. And, you know, the tension is a very real one. On the one hand, the idea of the laboratory of the states is a very good one, right? Prototype something and figure out how to get it to work before you globalize it because mm -hmm. that's the only sane thing mm -hmm. to do. On the other hand, you have game theory puzzles that will call, you know, let's say, for example, you had a, a rational system of taxation. And then let's say Oklahoma decides, well, you know what, we, we would like to attract some businesses. And so we're going to create a very hospitable business climate by lowering taxes in Oklahoma. Businesses start flooding to Oklahoma. Every other state notices, hey, there are businesses are leaving and they're going to Oklahoma. They all lower their taxes. And now your rational across the board tax structure has, in, has triggered a race to the bottom. Break it down. I understand. Break it down even smaller, though. I'm using the 50 states as the biggest it should be. I'm saying all of these things, the, the single, and, and Eisenhower talked about this in his farewell address, and it's brilliant. If we would have listened to just that one address, we would have fixed a lot of this stuff. The man, the single scientist working in a laboratory mm. that is doing it because he has an idea and says, I think this might work, and might work his whole life on it. That's pretty much gone. It's now white coats in a laboratory working for somebody that's getting grants from somebody else. So we, we're losing the individual spark. That's the key to Western society is the individual spark. Well, it's the environment that frees the individual to have the spark and to act on it. Yes. Right. So, you know, it's both things. You. And this yeah, I, I, I was going to say just that, that I, this feels like a different level of the problem, which you may be right. It may then fall into the right solution that's more global. But, you know, we've talked a lot about the problem with modern science, which is exactly as you describe that at this point, individuals have a very hard time saying, I want to be a scientist. I'm going to train to be a scientist. I'm going to go do science. You immediately get pulled into someone else's lab with someone else's grants, with someone else's questions that they've already asked. And, and there's and questions that you don't ask. That you, and, and lots of questions that you are precluded from asking because uh, who's, what kinds of questions are getting funded by NSF and NIH and DOD right now mm -hmm. is a question of fashion. And who's deciding what's fashionable? It is, in fact, you know, the elites, be they in science or politics. And it's very, very difficult. This is you know, one of the reasons, actually, that we were at some apparently you know, podunk little college in the Pacific Northwest for so long was that it actually provided the opportunity to ask whatever questions we wanted. It was one of the very rare institutions of higher ed, and it, it's not anymore, but it was one of the very rare institutions of higher ed in the modern world where you could actually investigate what you were interested in investigating. That said, <clears throat> you couldn't do so if you were trying to do high-tech science. Anything high tech Correct. still requires the big grants Correct. and the universities want that because they get a big chunk of the overhead and that is how they are running. So it's the you know, it's the business model that is the flaw. So isn't this in the exact same situation that our pilgrims, the founders, whatever came here for? That model is broken. It just doesn't work because it's now so corrupt that she can't work, except there's no place to go. I mean, that's one of the things I like about Elon Musk. Let's get off planet before this thing explodes. Um, you know, there's no place to go. We have to, right. We have to reboot without losing the important framework. 
Right. Well, we are, ironically enough, doing exactly the opposite of what we should be doing. We should be recognizing Everybody. that we are in the same boat and that n noticing each other's humanity is the first step and then figuring yep. out what we agree on is the second step. And from there, we can begin to engage the stuff that we disagree over and figure out where to go. And I would point out the, the solution to your puzzle, or at least the, the prototype for it, um, with respect to, you know, the laboratory of the states is actually a concept that comes out of Catholicism of all places called subsidiarity, which means everything should be governed at the lowest effective level, but it has to be the lowest effective level. And we, yeah, have, yeah, yeah. we have some global problems, right? right? Those problems have to be governed at a global level, right? Not having the oceans governed by anybody is, is a recipe for disaster. Right. But, but having the oceans governed by a group of people that are just on the take and are all afraid of China or all afraid of us or whoever is also not a solution. Right. That's so, a that's a Band-Aid that looks like it's going to heal, but it's festering underneath. Well, you have you have two problems tangled together there. So you've got the how are we to govern ourselves issue and then what are we to do about the the corruption? Right. Because we can we can say, look, certain things have to be governed at a global level and other things you, you don't want your, you know, your local parks governed by the, you know, the global yeah, structure. Right. right. So we have to have that thing. But even if you had a system that governed everything at the lowest effective level, if it's corrupt, then it may be, you know, <laughs> It may be worse than the problems it's built right. ostensibly to solve. So we have to solve the corruption issue as we address the let's make sure everything important is governed. And this is one of these places where the founders missed it because they hadn't seen sufficiently dangerous technology to intuit what a global problem right. of this sort would look like. There was no such thing as a manager or middle manager <laughs> when they were around. Right. You know what I mean? Well, they didn't. The one thing I think they really, truly missed was they didn't see that corporations could ever be more powerful than a government. Yeah, they, 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 they missed that. the questions of scale, right? Yeah. And they, they yeah, just they they could, not, they could not imagine it. Right. And that's, that's the first miss that I've seen. That they had all kinds of little safety mechanisms all over. That one, nothing. Nothing. And right. con yeah. too many conservatives are like, well, it's a corporation. They got no, 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 no. This is a different ballgame. This is a different ballgame. Right. We are we are yeah. de facto governed by these entities that uh, we have no protection, no protection. No. And, and I and they are merging with the governments of the world. And uh, I mean, I have always mocked. Oh, you know, these dystopian movies were like, ah, oh, yeah, well, he works for the corporation. And it's like, oh, <laughs> stop it. Don't laugh. That is right. exactly yep. the right or the left was right about that. The right was wrong. And now it seems like very few people even want to talk about that. It's right. like, wait, <laughs> right. <laughs> the, the so, major suddenly, error. Suddenly talking about the problems of the corporations is yeah. uh, is not something that's on the table anymore. Right. Right. Yeah. Which goes to a, a sort of overarching issue, which is, you know, the founders, of course, didn't know anything about evolution because it hadn't been described yet. What they effectively did was they created an evolving system. And so what we are living in is the consequences of the fact that they built a system that has all of the characteristics necessary to create adaptive evolution and creatures have evolved or as if creatures have evolved in it and many of them are predatory and they're extremely difficult to rein in because they i mean one of the things again they had an evolving system but it was evolving in structure so if you want to evolve mm -hmm. because it becomes outdated amend it okay which required the council to come together and so you weren't getting these little teeny changes that all of a sudden, a hundred years later, amount to something that doesn't recognize anything constitutional. You know right. what I mean? No, we, we, are, we are effectively on a craft hurtling through a dangerous landscape and there's no one at the helm. And it no just... one at the helm and, and nobody even, they'll give lip service to the Bill of Rights, but they don't actually stand for the Bill of Rights. Nobody does stand for the Bill of Rights. You're like... We can, can we just get, can you give me eight of those? I'll, I'll get on board with you. Can you give me eight of those rights that you're willing to stand for right, right. now? No, it's, it's all, I mean, it's very, there's almost literally nobody at the helm in the U.S. at the moment, right? We have 
uh, an apparently senile commander in chief who was effectively the choice of the DNC, which is not an elected body. And, the, and I don't it, know who's really actually running it. Right. I mean, in fact, I think if 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 you were in on those conversations, it would be even more frightening because I don't think anything's really running it. Right. It's you know, it's a corrupt entity and it is doing what corrupt entities do, which is serving very narrow short term interests. And, you know, the consequences for for us as Americans and for the planet are, you know, absolutely arbitrary. This is very different than what humans have ever experienced before, but it's very similar, isn't it? In some ways, yeah. I mean, we, we make a call for more campfires in the book, and as things are scaling up, there are, as you alluded to earlier, the equivalent of campfires that are happening outside of the reach of everyone else. Yes. Whereas used to be, you know, we have always had hierarchy. All of our groups, all of our tribal groups have always had hierarchy. Often male hierarchies are separate from female hierarchies and then to some degree some you know, familial level hierarchies. Um, but there, is, there was an ability, these like fission fusion groups were able to move in between each other and say, oh, I'm here now and you're here. And you know, sometimes they would war, but more often they would meet and maybe sometimes exchange people you know, in marriage, whatever. There wasn't the possibility of one of those groups simply owning everyone else. And in part, it was because people really did come together in a way that was equalizing. Campfire, breaking bread. I see the whites of your eyes. Yeah, the power which, amplifiers. Which, which it was, it's the power amplifiers of modernity that are making this very much unlike right. anything that came before. But it, but it also, and I don't know which came first, the technology or the loss of this belief, but it is, we didn't just come together to come together. We came together because in the end, I could see the whites of your eyes, but I truly believed you believed at the core, fundamentally, mm. the same kind of things that I believed. All men were created equal, you know, you have a right to free speech, all this stuff. When we lost that, I don't know how to, I don't know how to get together with somebody who says, no, the Bill of Rights, no, that, that's occasionally you can speak. You can speak if you have that. How do you, because it feels like the media, the amplification feels like half the country believes, half the country doesn't, or a third, a third, and then crazy, crazy, crazies on both sides. What is the truth? Well, I mean, there, there is a long history in humanity of othering those that, you, that are a threat to your own resources, right? In, in so many languages, uh, those who are not you, you, know, you the, the person who is, being, who is naming themselves are the chosen people, and everyone else is someone else. So it's not like that's new, right? But upon being able to come together, crossing those borders between tribes, generally there was a recognition of humanity. And I think... A, the scale problem, right? That we just, we have power amplifiers, we have too many people, and we have too little opportunity to actually engage. This, and this is where the screens are actually doing an incredible amount of damage that everyone talks about screens, but no, we don't have the measurements for all of the sensory stuff that mm. is being in, it, interchanged when we're actually in person with one another. But there is value in that that no one has named no one has even attempted to measure or a few people have. And as we spend less and less time actually like in vivo with one another, it's going to be easier and easier to go tribal in this way that seems permanent. Uh, I would argue in the U.S. we have to take ownership of the piece of we own. the equation that our side got wrong. Yeah. And so and each of us. Well, sure. Yeah. I mean, I went on the, they called it the Glenn Beck Apology Tour, and they said it was for something. No, I, you can't be human, uh, really, truly human, if half the country says they hate you and not go, gosh, do they have a point? I mean, am I that person at all? And I did apologize for things that I thought, you know, I shouldn't have said that, or I shouldn't have said it this way, or whatever. We have to start here, and then our side. And then the world, you know what I mean? Right. Well, it may not even, I mean, I agree. The, the hallmark of an honest broker is that you go back and clean up what you've got wrong. 
um, and that that is fundamental. And there aren't there aren't enough people doing that. But in this case, we have a tension. People detect something is wrong. Frankly, yeah, everybody knows everybody the system knows. is rigged, and for most people, the system is rigged against them. Yeah, and they detect it. And so the question is: Is that because the fundamentals are wrong? Is that because the the society that we have described is incorrect, or is it because it is not working? And what we are seeing on the left, the uh, collapse of reason that we are seeing on the left, is really um, lots of people who know that things are wrong, who know that they have been taken advantage of and been mistreated, misunderstanding what the source of that is and not realizing that the right thing to pursue is a repair of the unfairness of the system. It is not the dismantling of that system because yes. the system is the best thing that we have in terms of producing fairness. It just, we never got there. And, and this is where the right, I think, has made an error, which is that the right imagined the system worked better than it did. It imagined- I think that's changed a lot. I think it's changed a lot. I know 20 years ago, I was, golly, gee, you know, great and red, white, and blue. And now you're like, no, this, you know, and that, but that's the problem is uh, after you're done, if you have time, I'll take you over to our vault across the, the walkway here. I collect everything that I can to preserve American history, but I collect a lot of the dark stuff about American mm -hmm. history. I can outdo any liberal professor on the dark side <laughs> of American history. It's important to remember that, you know. But I think there's a lot of people, like I was 20 years ago, um, that are just like, no, that's, well, you, we did, make, what, I mean, no, we did some horrific things, horrific things that need to be addressed and set right and just talked about and like, don't ever do that again, that'll leave a mark. Um, but now, now, I think because the GOP 10 years ago so betrayed the the Tea Party people, and I don't mean all the Tea Party people. I mean the people who actually believed in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. It betrayed them. They went, "Ooh, that's one of the first questions I asked you. Your own side. Have you gone? Oh my gosh, that's not who I thought we were. Yeah, well, that's what we went through. Many of us. It depends what you mean by your own side. If you mean the Democratic Party, absolutely. The thing is, um, you know, it's it's metastatic, right? Yeah. It, 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 it is not. But it went beyond the GOP. It was, it was the whole system that we thought we knew what it was yeah, to I, trust. And it's like, no, that's dirty, too. It's all dirty. Well, we've I mean, started. Occupy on the left is to Tea Party on the right. And I think very similar things happened for those of us who were, who were hopeful that that could have been an answer. And to see it decay both for external and internal reasons, that it, you know, it, it it turned out not to have any possibility of success. That's what's sad about yeah. the Me Too movement. That's what's sad about BLM. Because I've talked to people who marched in Black Lives Matter uh, here in Houston where there was a shooting. And um, we all were huddling behind a car. And it didn't matter what color you were. And we all were like, okay, this is bad. And we started talking. And a lot of people were involved in that because they had real problems and real issues. But that's not what the system was made for. You know, that's not Black Lives Matter, Inc. Right. That's right. Total difference. Right. And, and, and this is exactly where we landed is yeah. Black Lives Matter as a slogan, as a belief, of course. Right. Right. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. It's too bad that it even needs to be said. Yeah. On the other hand, once you look at the fine print of what the organization was interested in, right. it's like, wait and a who second. even was running? I mean, the right. global thing is like, whoa. These are a bunch of white people. What are you doing? What is that? Right. Well, and, you know, all, from defunding the police to attacks yeah, yeah. on the family, it, the point was it had nothing to do with Correct. Black Lives Mattering. It was a, it was a very bizarre ideology, uh, ideological agenda that was a lethal hazard to what does work about our system. Well, and the same, the same arguments can be made without exactly the same corporate structure behind it for Me Too. Right? Like, Me yeah. Too had the potential to be... An awakening to, to actually reveal uh, to the vast majority of good men who are out there um, that the vast majority of women have 
unfortunate to really intolerable and horrible experiences as young women. And most men don't know that because most men aren't those sorts of men, yeah. right? Like that's, that's what it should have been. Instead it, it went re- off the rails because it was, maybe because it was designed to, I don't know, but yeah, it went off the rails. But we've, yeah. you know, I said at the end of the Barack Obama administration, he made me a better man. Mm. I didn't like him at all. I didn't like his policies at all, but he made me a better man because he pushed me against the wall all the time. And I had to go, wait, is that right? Or am I wrong? Or what, what's, what's happening? We are learning a lot. There was a lot of good that came out of Me Too and Black Lives Matter. Even if it wasn't directly related to their goals, a lot of people did step back and they didn't necessarily join in. They were just like, you know, they have a point on that and that and that. And that's good. Yeah. Some but- good things. I mean, to, to get back to an earlier point, you know, it's, I think liberals had so many successes in the 20th century, right? You know, the women, women's emancipation and civil rights and gay rights and worker protections, worker protections. And this, these became values that almost everyone holds in common. Mm-hmm. And I think because of that momentum, it now seems to many on the left that change must always be necessary. And as you said earlier, Brett, you know, change isn't inherently good. Change isn't inherently bad. Change will sometimes be necessary and change isn't always necessary. And if we're actually moving in the right direction, upending the system that's moving in the right direction is clearly going to be a betrayal of the values that you are claiming to have. Are you guys optimistic? Um, Occasionally. Well, if I can return (laughs) to the idea of um, an adaptive valley. Things are very dark, and that doesn't necessarily mean one shouldn't be optimistic because in some sense they would have to be in order for us to accomplish what we need to accomplish now. The dark is before the dawn. Right. And so the problem, if you think about, you know, the uh, adaptive landscape I was describing, the problem is if you have to move on from the opportunity that you've been exploiting and to find a new one, it is very easy to head in a direction where that opportunity does not exist. It's very easy to pass into that valley and to not arrive somewhere. So what you really need is very careful thinking about where that next opportunity is. And whatever the explanation for it, um, if I, you know, if I could get one thought into the mind of Americans generally, it would be that something has us divided for reasons we may never know. There may not even be reasons. It may just be some process. But the key to us getting out of this is the recognition that most of us agree on the values to be pursued. We agree on what a good society would look like. We may disagree on how close we are and what might be done to get us the rest of the way, but we agree. We don't want a system that is rigged in favor of one race and against another, for example. We don't want a system that bars people from doing whatever job they want to do because of the sex they were born into. We want a fair system in which opportunity is broadly distributed. Now, once you recognize that virtually everybody you meet can agree to that much, and then you realize that we've all been led to believe that there's another team and that those people don't agree, they don't agree with you on anything, right? right? That they're bad people who want bad things. Then the point is, well, all right, wouldn't, wouldn't the right thing to do be to recognize we know what the objective of the project is, we all understand something has gone awry, and the correct thing to do is to talk to each other about how we might get ourselves out of this and get back on track where we can fight about the details of how to get there, not where we're going. Historically, you guys are on exactly the right path, one that wasn't necessarily taken um, the last time we had a horrible, horrible world war um, in my research over the years on the Holocaust. The biggest thing that happened was nobody knew Jews. The Jews that were saved were generally saved by people who said, yeah, the Jews are like that, but not this one. I know this one. And when you understand that, you realize we better start talking to each other. That's right. Because, oh, I'll save a conservative or a liberal because I know this one. But the rest of them are like that. No, that's not true. That's not true. I call it the comic bookification process. Yes. We believe that we have the capacity to be superheroes, and we believe that there are supervillains on the other side of the screen or out there in the world. And 
it is the very, very, very rare human being who is either. Mm-hmm. Right? We are, just you know, look within yourself and see, no matter how remarkable you are, what your weaknesses are. Or if you are in the you're in the opposite camp and you feel that you're not doing well, find the strengths that you have and recognize that that mixture in different amounts, in different relative amounts, is going to be present in every single other human being. Yep. You know, so it stops us from wheeling uh, gallows in front of people's houses. That's right. Right. Yeah. Which, of course, is returning into <laughs> yeah. fashionability. Um, I, I'll tell you something funny, right? We live in Portland, which, you know, is almost a cartoon of Bless you. Of liberalism. You know, Texas exists. Right. <laughs> we have, we and have there are liberals it. here. <laughs> we, we, have, we have met them. Yes. Um, but even in Portland, where you would imagine that there's just simply no reason to be accessed, a funny thing happens, for me at least, and I know for Heather, when we are open about our doubts about the conventional wisdom of the left, which is that people who would espouse, you know, all of the, the usual slogans, as soon as they hear that you're actually, you have your own doubts and that you're willing to voice them, it is amazing what people will volunteer. So it, why do you think they work so hard to silence people who have just a little bit of courage? Yeah. They need to silence that courage. They need to crush it. They need That's, it. Courage is contagious. Cour- your yes. Courage is contagious. And You're absolutely contagious. right. Yes. And this is where this impulse to authoritarianism comes from, right? Because they need to control the conversation in order that the doubts Correct. don't emerge and restore us to a conversation that uh, might actually stand a chance of putting us back on track. Yeah. And it is, it is remarkable how many conversations both Brett and I have had with, you know, UPS drivers, cashiers, mm-hmm. waitresses, whatever, um, or just overheard um, while you know, paddleboarding or, you know, sitting in a park and then sometimes talking with the people and sometimes just eavesdropping. But, you know, it's Portland. It's mostly liberals. And the number of people who are saying this thing is coming, it's authoritarian, it's dangerous, and we need to stand up is high. It's still quiet, but it's a lot of people. It, uh, my guess is it's coming from the left faster than it's coming from the right, but it will come from the right too. You're, we're passing all of the exits where you're getting to such, I mean, this is the way revolutions happen, communist revolutions happen. You sow the seed of discontent, you overload the system, you get it so nothing's working, there's no safety anywhere, and the people will cry out, help us, and they will, and they'll crush that. Um, And it'll be either side that does it if we don't change our way soon. Yeah, it's it's imperative, and, um, you know, we are prevented from doing it by being told that, uh, you know, you will, you, will, you will be guilty by virtue of your associations yes. if you talk to people on the other side. And those of us who have talked to people on the other side, um, you know, have paid a price for it. On the other hand, it's quite clear that that is the road forward. It is. You know, it is. Anybody who can't manage it is, is, is not going to be of help. I started this podcast three years ago, and you were the number one target to put on this show <laughs> because I wanted this show to be a model where people can disagree and we go away friends. We can see each other going, you're a normal person. I'm a normal person. We don't hate each other and we don't hate the country and we don't hate freedom. We just disagree. Right. That's right. Let's not conflate the ideas with the person. I'm glad that you're both here. I hope you come back. Thank you. Thank you so much. so much.